The reason that we're doing this is because I want you to know for sure that God's word is trustworthy. God's word is relevant. God's word has something to say about nearly everything that's meaningful and relevant and, 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 and um, uh, I guess, important to our lives. That's why it's God's word. The Bible is really unique. All right, so we've already covered in the last session an introduction to Planet X. I'd like to give credit where credit is due. Gil Broussard uh, has been supplying me with some of the graphics that I'm going to be using in this presentation, so I really thank him for his research. Once again, if um, I fly through some of these biblical events and you uh, don't know them, I'm not going to explain them. I just don't have time in this presentation, so please do your catch-up using the 4,000 years of history, which is something that we've taught in our church twice. It's a curriculum to take you from creation to Christ in only 12 hours. It's a great curriculum uh, that's also used in Bible schools. And uh, we do that as the foundation for eschatology. Once you understand history, then you can understand prophecy. But if you don't understand history, there is really no hope of making uh, sense out of the book of Revelation. It really uh, is important. God revealed things in order for us to understand. All right, we talked about... Um, Planet X, why should Christians uh, care? We gave you an introduction to the planets for those who maybe are not updated on astronomy. In the second portion, we're going to give you an introduction to miracles for those who may not be familiar with theology. And then we're going to combine the two to understand biblical astronomy or scientific miracles. And that might sound strange to you, but I want to uh, explain it by the end. It's not strange. I heard somebody say this, before science, everything was a miracle. What do you think of that? I believe it displays the absolute arrogance of evolutionary thinking. See, as we look back in time, we actually find that people built roads, aqueducts, architecture that 2,000 years later still stand. Whereas none of our roads, none of our houses can last that long. And yet to assume that when we go back in time, these people were dumber than we were, they were easily fooled, easily tricked, they didn't have the same common sense that we have, you really would have to live with a contradiction if you believe evolution on the one hand and then look at the evidence of history and, and civilizations and realize these people are very, very smart and used amazing technology that we still cannot compare to. So I want you to understand this. The Lord gave me this phrase. Explaining a miracle does not make it less of a miracle. We can describe how life forms in a womb, but we can't create even a single rose. Life is still a miracle. We may describe how sickness gets healed by our immune system over time. But the miracle is in God's ability to shorten the time. Jesus, when we encounter him, Jesus speeds up the healing for us. Explaining a miracle does not make it less of a miracle. We can describe how water turns into wine through fermentation over time, but we certainly can't do it at a wedding party, can we? With God, the miracle often lies in his ability to orchestrate perfect timing. You see, in Luke chapter 5, we find a story. When Jesus told Peter to let down the net, Peter and the other fishermen were not dumb. They understood that catching fish was not a miracle. The miracle was the timing. After they had toiled all night and got nothing, at the moment they obeyed Jesus, they caught a boat sinking load of fish. The fish just happened to be there at that very moment. The apostles did not believe in Jesus' miracles merely because they could not explain it, but because no one but God could have done it for them. No amount of explanation could ever take away their miracle. Do you understand that? Explaining a miracle doesn't make it less of a miracle. It's conceivable, given enough time, that we might one day 
possessed the knowledge of how natural forces could part the Red Sea all by itself. And there are lots of people that try to say how it could have done that by itself, by natural forces. Okay, fine. But it doesn't explain the, away the miracle because the miracle was in the timing. The Red Sea parted when Moses lifted up his rod. And then the Red Sea fell back into place the moment Pharaoh's army pursued their Jewish ex-slaves. The miracle was in the timing. The miracle wasn't in just the water standing up. Does that make sense? Because if you understand that, that's how God works in our lives. Most of the miracles we're waiting for is about God orchestrating perfect timing in our lives. And it's beyond, beyond anyone else's ability to do such things. So it doesn't really matter once you've had a miracle from God. It doesn't matter what the naysayers say. It doesn't matter how many people doubt it because I know Jesus saved my life. I know he did at the time when I needed him. I know he showed up at certain times when no one else could have been responsible for what happened. And that's what makes me a believer. Not because I can't explain some of the things he does. Sure, we can explain many things. But you can't orchestrate that kind of timing unless you're God. So now we come to planet X. Get ready. Luke chapter 23, verse 44 to 45. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. Matthew 27, verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Is it a miracle to tear a veil? Of course not. The miracle was it tore from the top to the bottom. Because if a man did it, it would have torn it from the bottom to the top. See, it's always these things that people say, I can explain things, but God always has one up on humans. So when the veil was torn from top to bottom, the earth quaked and the rocks were split. What's interesting about this is at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, there was a three-hour eclipse in our time from noon to 3 p.m. plus an earthquake. Well, how is that possible? Have you ever thought about the fact that God just left us a clue about another planetary body? Why? Because the maximum time that our moon can eclipse a sun is 7 minutes and 31 seconds. Can't do any more than that. How can you have a three-hour eclipse? Well, it's possible with the flyby of a much larger object at least seven times the size of the Earth. In other words, perhaps planet X. There's always an explanation the miracle was the timing. And Jesus says, you know, it is finished. Gives up the ghost. And then, lights out for three hours. See, no human being can orchestrate that. Only God can do that. And then an earthquake as well because of the gravitational pull or the electric force of another planet passing by. So Yeshua's sacrifice included some major events, an earthquake, and a three-hour eclipse. There's a detail to this picture that I, I don't have time to explain, but there's some amazing things that happen at the crucifixion. It's not just merely, you know, uh, other people have been crucified, so Jesus' sacrifice is the same as that. It's not just mere crucifixion. It's all of the events combined and the fact that he was sinless and did it for you and me. Let's go to another biblical event, Joshua's long day. In Joshua chapter 10, verse 11, and it happened as they fled before Israel and were on the descent of Beth Haran that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven. Heaven is where? Look up. A lot of things happen from the sky in the Bible. So these hailstones fell on them as far as As uh, Azekah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. Verse 12, then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said, in the sight of Israel, sun, stand still over uh, Gibeon and moon in the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? That's the book of the righteous. Jasher is not a name. It means righteous. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. That's what? 12 hours. Daylight. And there has been no day like that before it or after it, that the Lord heeded the voice of a man. 
A scientific explanation for the Earth's rotation slowing down is possible. It's possible. The miracle was in the timing. The moment Joshua stood there on the battlefield and said, Son, stand still. There are scientific forces that, that could act on the rotation of the planet. Namely, planet X crossing the Earth's orbit on Passover in 1400 BC. That could have brought the meteor shower that killed more enemies than Joshua's army and extended daylight by 12 hours. All right, and this is a scientist who's done all the computation, so I'm not going to go through all that. On Joshua's long day, planet X could have looked 50 times the size of the moon. Could this be what Jesus spoke about in Luke chapter 21 when he said, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. He clearly is pointing us towards a direction that most of the church and the world are not looking. He says, watch out, something's going to happen astronomically. By the way, Joshua's long day, guess what, was recorded as China's short day. Isn't that amazing? In around four, uh, 1400 BC. There are records of that. And then, again, the Chinese who have the longest astronomical record of any civilization uh, reported a guest star in 1054 AD. And that's also the same time when the British recorded, and there's a painting here, of some stellar body with a massive debris uh, tail following it. And there's a drawing of that right there on the right side. Well, let's go to Noah's flood. I think you're going to be very surprised by this. We have covered Noah's flood extensively in the 4,000 Years of History um, DVD set. I think it's uh, number three. Uh, I've brought that teaching out to many churches, and it always attracts, you know, uh, appeals to the teenagers and the youth. Uh, they're just amazed. Noah's flood was really just an amazing incident, and it's full of science in the Bible. And uh, so much of what we see today is a record. You know, I, I believe all the fuel that we pump into the cars, it's a reminder of Noah's flood. Millions of dead organic material buried suddenly form fossil fuel. So for all the people who say, I don't believe the Bible, I don't believe it happened, you're pumping it into your car every day. It's amazing, isn't it? But here today, I'm going to give you some new details uh, in addition to what you learn in the 4,000 Years series. In Genesis chapter 7, <clears throat> verse 11 and 24, let me remind you what happened. In the 600th year of Noah's life, this is what people don't know, they thought it just rained for 40 days, it didn't. Number one, it says, God said, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open. Which is an interesting phrase. It's not just that it rained. Something broke apart in the heavens and something broke apart in the earth's crust. And the waters prevail on the earth 150 days. Please say 150 days. Okay, no detail in the Bible is extraneous or superfluous. Everything is there by design. Gives us a clue to something. And by the way, most things happen not once. Almost nothing in the Bible happens once. So everything that happens here is a prelude to something else. Only in Noah's flood, God promised, I'm never going to flood the whole world in the same way. Yet everything usually happens twice. So these details here, they'll, they'll be handy in the end times, 150 days. Because guess what? Book of Revelation also says one of the trumpet judgments will last five months. Five months is five times 30 days, 150 days. Jewish calendar days are 30 days a month. Very interesting, there's parallels between Genesis and Revelation all the way through. Can't get into all of it. But here's what happened. The Bible is saying the flood was not mere rain for 40 days. It says the canopy of water that was ruptured from above. There was above the atmosphere another layer of water. Remember the firmament separated the waters from the waters in Genesis? There was water above. All right? And that was ruptured, and then it all broke apart and fell down. The earth's crust was also ruptured from below. And 150 days later, the waters receded. Well, how is that possible? Well, if you map out planet X's orbit, it seems that planet X has an orbit that crosses the Earth's orbit twice in a period of 150 days. So you see point one is the sun, point two is the first crossing of the earth, point three is the second crossing as it leaves the solar system. 
So here's a scenario that may explain Noah's flood. Planet X crosses the Earth's orbit, and then each encounter brought debris and meteors upon the Earth. So here's the first flyby. On the second Passover, 3000 BC, remember Passover is the only feast where if you missed it, God gave you grace, you can celebrate it a second month, the month later. Well, Noah recorded that on the second Passover, 3000 BC or 5000 years ago, uh, the waters broke from above the heavens. Well, a meteor shower would have done that, right? Small uh, meteors uh, would have opened the floodgates of heaven, shattering the upper firmament that divided the waters from the waters. Then, five months later, it makes a revolution around the sun, comes back, the earth happens to meet on this occasion. Uh, the debris of planet X, once again, as it exits the solar uh, system and the earth's orbit. And so this is probably what happened. 150 days later, a second flyby of planet X drags a 110-mile-wide asteroid into a collision course with Earth. And there's a reason why we have quite an exact figure on the size of this asteroid or this meteor. We'll show you in a moment. But we have to say asteroid because it's so big. Here's a moment of impact. Um, a scientist calculated uh, at a traje trajectory of 22, uh, or an angle of 22 degrees. There's the moment of impact. It would have sent shock waves into the Earth's core and all throughout the Earth. And that would have ejected some of the Earth's crust, leaving basins of wa for water to recede into, which today forms our oceans. Something catastrophic happened. Now, science always denies catastrophic events until catastrophic events happen. Did you know that last week an earthquake, 7.7 .7 earthquake in Pakistan, created an island like that? If you don't know, just go on the news and see it. They always say over millions and millions and millions of years, and yet on the news, turn on, boom, an island just got created. In the same way, something suddenly happened and the waters then receded. Something scientific, something explainable had to have happened. Well, a 110-mile uh, diameter meteor or asteroid would have impacted the Earth, and uh, the planet X gravitational electric influence would explain the start of Noah's flood, canopy broke, the end of the flood, a meteor came and then ejected some of the crust, which left basins. It would also explain the tilt of the earth without which we wouldn't have seasons. So at the moment of impact, the earth was pushed 23.5 degrees, which allows for seasons. I always believe in, in the beginning, God didn't have, there was no rain in the beginning and there were no seasons in the beginning. Why do we have seasons? Because this impact at Noah's flood tilted the earth. Now we got seasons, winter, summer, and all that. And it would have also cracked the earth into tectonic plates. Does the Bible talk about this? Yes, it does. Isaiah 24, verse 19 and 20. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface. Verse 19, the earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and totter like a hut. That sounds like the earth's 23.5 degree tilt. Planet X could provide a scientific explanation for all these things we observe. The Earth's crust is definitely cracked like an eggshell into tectonic plates. What we see on the globe is not exactly the plates. Underneath, they're all cracked. Now, one problem a scientist had with this was that if such a large impact had occurred, the amount of heat that would have been generated would have wiped out all life. That's just the physics of it. And so this person who didn't believe the Bible challenged this other scientist who believes the Bible and says, well, you got a heat problem. It's, it's just impossible that this happened 5,000 years ago. He says, well, how about this? What if the entire surface of the planet was covered in water? Isn't water a perfect conductor of heat? Would have absorbed all the heat. In fact, I saw on the news today uh, global warming scientists, because they're having a real hard time now explaining global warming, they're saying, oh, well, the ocean is such a good conductor of heat. Global warming is happening. We are responsible, but the oceans have absorbed all the heat. You see, the miracle was the perfect timing. He says, get in the ark. The meteor shower came. Planet X could have passed by. Maybe that's the gravitational force that pushed all these meteors 
in Noah's way. He got in the ark, he was safe, then it came. Then the big meteor that helped the waters to recede came at the moment where the entire earth was covered with water, absorbing most of the shock, most of the heat. Amazing? God is amazing. His miracles usually involve perfect timing. Now, the question remains, is there any evidence of such an impact? Are we just kind of making wishful, is this wishful thinking? Well, I'm going to show you something that you will never forget. Most truths are staring at, at us in the face. It's right in front of our eyes, but we don't know it's there until somebody points it out to us. So I'm going to point it out to you, the evidence of this impact. It's called the Gulf of Mexico. This is a perfect circular crater uh, left by an impact of an asteroid. Does that look like a perfect circle to you? Pretty much for, for geography. Compare that to the Arizona crater, which is 0.7 mile wide. The Gulf of Mexico's crater is 1,100 miles wide, and we usually uh, calculate that a meteor is 10% the size of the impact crater. That's why we have quite a good idea of how big this thing was that came at the end of Noah's flood, or in, as the waters receded. What's interesting is if we take pictures, subterranean, sub, uh, sub-ocean pictures, we also can see there's a visible landslide under the ocean. Can you see that? At the top of the circle? The land slid into the ocean in the distant past. And if this is, ha- has happened before, this area from Houston to Louisiana to New Orleans, is a high-risk area of, for collapse a second time if there was another Planet X pass by. So Houston to New Orleans could be unstable. Also, you know that oil and gas are found in abundance in this area because plant life was buried suddenly by a previous landslide. So 70 to 80 percent of America's domestic oil and gas flows through the pipelines of this high-risk zone. Now, the shock waves sent, uh, were sent around the world. Is there em- any evidence of that? Sure there is. It caused an uplift on the other side of the planet. It's called the Himalayan mountain range. Take a look at it. It's a perfect curve. It's the same curve as the Gulf of Mexico sent to the other side. In other words, Himalayans were formed in a matter of seconds. Number two, it also means the highest peaks of the Himalayas did not exist at the time of Noah's flood. So a lot of people like to argue and say, well, how much would it have to rain to reach all the way to the top of Mount Everest? Well, excuse me, there was no Mount Everest. Amazing. God has an answer to everything. And it's right there. It's staring you in the face. Next time you look at the globe, it's all there. But I'll take you even further. This is a NASA satellite map of gravity. Did you know that gravity is unevenly distributed on the Earth? You are slightly heavier in Asia. That's why we have to eat rice and not pasta. You're slightly heavier in Asia because the land density is greater. Well, what could have caused that? It indicates pressure wave. A powerful meteor impacting during a total global flood is a logical explanation for this anomaly on our planet. Let's talk about future implications because that's the part everyone wants to know. What does this matter to me? Well. If you've not uh, gone through my End Times and Revelation series, I'm going to do a very quick run-through. Revelation is a timeline. Revelation indicates that worse things will happen during the seven-year tribulation. I think that's pretty scary, don't you think? So we don't want to be there for that. We want to believe Jesus now. We want to accept the Savior now. He's giving us warning through all of this prophecy and science. You don't want to be here for this. Well, could Planet X be the explanation for these events, these judgments in the book of Revelation? And if so, when is Planet X, or Nibiru is another name for it, when is it coming back? All right, you remember that I told you the seven seals or seven pre-tribulation seals. There are the seven trumpets from chapter 7 to 10, and then the seven bowl judgments from chapter 16 to 19. These are all timelines. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls are just word pictures for judgments. That's 21 judgments in total. In other words, 21 events in sequential order. Next week, we're going to cover these in order, right? Not this time. We don't have the time to do it, but I promise you we'll get to it. You will see Revelation like you've never seen it before. 
What we know, something is coming. That's what the book of Revelation is saying for sure. I'm gonna give you just two of the uh, events. The sixth seal, I believe we're waiting at, for, for it or we're in the midst of it. Revelation 6 verse 13, and, a, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth. What are meteors called? Falling stars. The stars of heaven falling to the earth are meteors. As a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind, then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. And then the church age ends. Tribulation begins on the seventh trumpet. I believe rapture happens on the sixth, uh, seventh seal. So in other words, the church age closes with a meteor shower. But not a bad one. This is the revelation God gave me. You can take it or leave it. But in all the other places during tribulation, he says when there's a meteor shower, hail stones fell on top of them. But at the close of the church age, we'll see something, and he calls it, oh, it's like figs dropping. Well, question, would you rather have a fig drop on your head or would you rather have a stone drop on your head? Yeah, I'll take figs anytime. What do the figs mean? I think God is saying, you're gonna see it, it's not gonna hurt. Well, guess what? The scientists have just found this week a meteor shower, unprecedented meteor shower is due and they've already put a date on it next year. And it's all in line with the tetrad, the solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, all the stuff that we've been talking about. It's right there. I'll show it to you next week. All right? So uh, we know that's true. And then the first trumpet, which is the tribulation starts, Revelation 8, verse 7, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown down to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. In other words, tribulation starts with a massive meteor shower, and this one hurts. This one, a third of everything gets destroyed. A third. Not bad. God says a third is destroyed. In other words, two-thirds escapes unharmed. So the question has always been, well, what does that mean? How can a third of everything be destroyed? But you know, the answer is staring us in the face. Once I show it to you, it will be as clear as day. You ready for it? How can a third of everything be destroyed? Why would God tell us such a thing? Well, take a look at the globe. Asia, Africa, and Europe make up two-thirds of the landmass of the planet. North and South America make up a third of the landmass and also a third of the oceans. Take a good hard look at that globe. Revelation 8 is predicting which side of the earth will be struck. Scientists will make an erroneous calculation because they have no model for a 12-hour rotational delay. In other words, when this thing starts coming close, scientists will say, this is the safe side. America will be safe. But God had recorded in the book of Joshua, that one of the times when planet X pa passed by, it actually caused the rotation to slow down by 12 hours. Unless you're a Christian, you have no concept of that. Unless you believe in the electric universe, you won't even suspect that could happen. There's no model for that. And so what I believe will happen is as, th as the meteors come, just like the Bible says, instead of repenting and saying, God is right, I want to believe the Bible now before I get killed, they say, Science will take care of this. We're so smart, we've already predicted where it's gonna land. It's gonna land in Asia, Europe, the Middle East, Africa. And I believe people will buy tickets and get on airplanes to go over to the Americas and not realize they're going to their doom. And they will die there. And that's why in the book of Revelation it says, when Babylon goes up in smoke, everybody cries. Why? Because they didn't expect it. They thought, no, 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 America's gonna escape, the rest are gonna get hit. Then suddenly, within 12 hours, the whole picture changes. You can't leave the, the, the continent fast enough. And then everybody starts wailing and crying, oh, Babylon, Babylon, how great you were. We didn't expect it. Well, you know, the scientists always say, like, they expect everything, they can calculate everything. But you need to know, this is why I say you need the 4,000 years of history. You need to know the whole gamut of the Bible. Now all the events will line up, all the events will become relevant to understanding the book of Revelation. So how true God's word is in Hosea chapter four, verse six, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I believe even Christians 
will end up, instead of trusting the Bible, they will trust their astronomers, their scientists, their government, saying, everything's going to be okay. Everybody fly over to America. It'll be the safest place in the world. Now, by the way, I had some YouTube commenters say, well, they like me until I start saying bad things about America. I'm not saying bad things about America. I like America. You notice I'm an Australian who speaks with an American accent. I lived in New York for 10 years. I was educated, got my bachelor degree in, in well, I started in America and finished in Canada. Um, so I am a friend of America. And I'm telling the American watchers, trust the Bible, believe the Bible. If we see this warning from scientists, they say, this side is safe, I bet you the truth is just the opposite. The other side of the earth will be safe. So I personally believe we are favored. I believe Australia will be safe. I believe for sure Israel will be safe. I mean, you want to go to a safe place, you better go to Israel. Amen? That will be the safest place. But I think Australia, we're on the, we're on the other side, the two-thirds side, which should be safe. So don't reject the knowledge of God, the knowledge of the Bible. Trust God. Don't just trust in the words of man because the words of man will send you to hell. Amen? So now the question is, can lightning strike twice? And what I mean by that is, we know it's happened before. There's a crater right there that forms a near-perfect circle. If meteors of the meteors of the tribulation struck America, then lightning would strike twice. Gil Broussard has made a very bold prediction that Planet X's near uh, next flyby will be at Passover 2016. And he's actually calculated all of its you know, orbit and given all these dates. And uh, he's as, d- as deeply studied and researched in this area as anybody I know. So I just put that up there and time will tell if he's right. He bases this on an average orbit of about 300, 320 to 330 years per revolution of planet X. And he predicts actually uh, very boldly that on the 23rd of March 2016, we will have a close flyby of planet X. Not far away. So something is coming. There will probably be a scientific explanation for every disaster that will happen in the book of Revelation. But the miracle is in the timing. They will occur in sequence, predicted, and at the time leading up to the Messiah's second coming. That's the miracle. The miracle is perfect timing. Romans chapter nine, chapter five, verse six says, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Meaning, it couldn't have been a better time. God could not have picked a better time to send his son when the world was unified by the Roman roads, by a common language, the Greek language, and the news could spread very fast, at the perfect time and the perfect place, the Messiah came, changed the world, split time in half. There's no one like Jesus. He's not just like Buddha or Muhammad or these other people, Confucius. He is unique. His claims are totally unique and different from everyone else. And God said, in the perfect time, He sent forth his son and he died. Even when we didn't know we needed to be saved, he took care of our sin problem so that today we can hear that he is the salvation that we need. Do you need a miracle? I do, I sure do. Coming to church may not be a miracle, but I want you to know being in this church at this time, right now, is a miracle. How much did God have to do to get you to sit here in these pews at this very moment? He moved heaven and earth for you to be here right now. So please don't don't miss the supernatural of God looking for something that cannot be explained. You can explain a lot of things that God does. God's not trying to be sensational. So often we think, you know, if if it's sensational, then it's God. Well, that puts distance between God and and, and us. God does a lot of ordinary things in a very supernatural way. He brought you to church today. Watching this DVD or perhaps on YouTube, certainly not a miracle. There are millions of YouTube videos. But you hearing this message right now is a miracle because you can be anywhere. God sets us up for a miracle by orchestrating perfect timing. It's up to us to open our eyes 
and believe. If you're a pastor listening to this right now, it's time for you to preach Bible prophecy or invite a guest speaker on the subject. We cannot censor a third of the Bible and feed our sheep properly. Bible prophecy is a third of the Bible. Very important that we make sure that Christians are equipped with the right accurate biblical knowledge. It might actually save their life when the time comes. If you are a pre-Christian, you don't yet know Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior. You might have been to church before. I'm not talking about that. If you're a pre-Christian, you're not born again, it's time for you to receive your miracle. You have to do two things. Repent of your sins before it's too late and call on Jesus to save you. He says, just call. I mean, literally, like if you saw a meteor about to fall in your house, all you have to do is say, Jesus! And he says, you'll be saved because there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must call to be saved. Calling on Jesus' name saves us. So always remember that. If you're facing any trouble situation, uh, difficult situation, just call on Jesus. Just say, Jesus, come and save me, help me. And he promised he will. The timing couldn't be better. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, the Bible says, now is the day of salvation. You're hearing God's word and God's truth has come into your ear, into your mind, into your heart because now is the time he's calling you to himself. I wish that you would pray this prayer so that you'd be saved. Can you say this with me? With all your heart, say it to God and he will answer. Say, dear Lord, I repent of my sins. I'm sorry for not believing you before. But now I trust you. I trust your son, Jesus. I'm ever grateful that I don't have to save myself. I can't do it, but Jesus can. Now I call on you, Jesus. Save me. You died on the cross for me. You shed your blood for me. You forgave my sins. Now I'm free. I believe you resurrected from the dead. You are Lord. You're the Lord of my life. From this day forward, use me to be a light to other people. Make me a blessing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Congratulations if you prayed that prayer. Uh, for the first time, God has written your name in the book of life. You belong to him. You, he will never leave you or forsake you. Make sure you get into a good church and start reading the Bible and sharing your faith with others. Obviously, you know I'm very interested in time. And uh, I would like to recommend, if you like the subject of time, we did two teachings called Redeeming the Time. And they're two of my favorites. I really enjoyed them. The uh, first one is called Top Ten Time Wasters. And the other... One is seven habits of highly effective time managers. So what do we do if we know the time is short? We don't panic. You need to learn how to value and manage time better. So I highly recommend that. That's at discover.org.au. If any of this, again, was a little bit fast or you're just interested in studying more, my entire end time teaching is right in front of you. Uh, the end time series is six hours. The Book of Revelation series is 10 hours. The Hebrew Roots of End Time Prophecy is uh, five hours. That's it, 21 hours. It's the best that I've got to share with you and the world on the subject of End Time Prophecy. It's not everything I talk about, but I think right now God's got his finger on this subject. People are talking about Revelation, singing Revelation, teaching Revelation, and I hope that you're not gonna miss out and not understand what God has written in the final book. You know, you don't go to a movie and walk out in the last 10 minutes, do you? No. So you want to find out what happens at the end. It's exciting. If you believe in Jesus, you don't have to be scared. Amen. He is our protector. He's our savior. We must be about our father's business. Helping people, healing people, saving people, preaching the good news to them. We don't have bad news to share. We have good news to share. Amen.